I was 10, 11, 12, I don't remember, in line for the movies. And my, there were two guys in line in front of us, like three or four people in front of us holding hands. And my mother pulled me to her, not my siblings, just me, and looked at my father and said, they're weird. Which just made me look at those guys and I went, oh, now I get it. I'm weird like they're weird. And, and I looked at them and I thought, they look happy, they look like they're in love. Um, I'll be fine. Inform brings you incredible stories. I left two days before the revolution. It killed me so hard. James has never experienced the taste of fruits that haven't been attacked by pesticides, just like he's never experienced a neighborhood that hasn't been attacked by bullets. Some things just go hand in hand. People say what's on their mind. I think that it is a, um, a cardinal sin to lie to the American people um, about war. Partisanship is a version of narcissism. In downtown San Francisco, the Commonwealth Clubs and Forum curates events that bring you face to face with the world's changemakers. One third of the wage gains that women have made since the 1960s were made as a result of the birth control pill. Twitter is a technology that I don't think we've seen before in this world. Since 1903, the most innovative leaders have come to the Commonwealth Club to share their vision. Sharing cars, sharing their homes, sharing, sharing a shared dream, a shareable American dream. That could work. You each can play a role in helping us chart a better future. Housing and health and education and policy all live close to the surface in us when our children are murdered. It's all the same story. We bring together the visionaries shaping the emerging trends in technology. It was a combination of instant and telegram. It was the idea that you could take a moment in time and you could capture it and you could just send it out and broadcast it with the entire world. I just threw the site together in about a week when I was at school. Oh, great. We've got angels, we've got incubators, we've got accelerators, we've got seed funds, we've got crowdfunding. We eat. We drink. <laughs> One of our first dates ever, we pickled like 100 pounds of herring and made 300 pounds of sauerkraut. Wow. Yay! We never shy away. 75% of the people of this country want universal health care and expect it. And damn it, let's go. Concentrated, deep, slow, loving, tender, passionate sex. Whether you want to be on the cusp of current events or feast on pop culture. I should have a great time writing. I should write a book that is as fun as any party I'd be skipping. Inform events are fun and action-packed. I have a sh an anthropology scarf that does that <laughs> twisty thing, so. Come feed your mind and soul and celebrate the future with Inform. I love San Francisco and every time I come back here I remember that this is the only city in America that has magic. Hi everyone, I'm Crystal Contreras and I'm the director of Inform. Welcome to today's program with Hint CEO, Kara Golden. This conversation will be moderated by Guy Kawasaki, Chief Evangelist at Canva. If you'd like to ask either of our speakers a question during this program, you can do so in the chat or comment section of the live stream that you're currently watching. The Commonwealth Club has temporarily suspended in-person events, but we are dedicated to keeping you informed during this pandemic. We're going full speed ahead with the full slate of live online programs. Most of these conversations are currently free to the public, so we do ask that you consider donating to the club to help us continue our work. You can visit us at commonwealthclub.org slash online to learn more, and you can also text the word DONATE to 415-329-4231 during this program. You can find this information and more in the description box below. Now, please join me in welcoming Kara Golden and Guy Kawasaki to Inforum. Thank you very much. Thank you. I have to admit that I am sitting here, Kara, wondering how can we get in that highlight reel? I mean, what could we do virtually? That would get <laughs> I know exactly. How, how do we make that happen? Yeah. So listen, good afternoon. Well, welcome to today's virtual program with Inforum at the Commonwealth Club. I'm Guy Kawasaki. I am the chief evangelist of Canva and the creator of the Remarkable People podcast and friend of Kara Golden. Uh, 
This is going to be a really fun conversation with Kara. She's the CEO of Hint Water, although they do much more than water, as you'll soon see or soon hear. And we're going to discuss her new book called Undaunted, Undaunted, like Undaunted, baby. So uh, if you would like to ask Kara any questions, uh, if you're on YouTube or Facebook, just put those questions in the uh, comment section or the chat section. And uh, we will try to address them at the end. So uh, let's get started. With no further ado, uh, here is Kara Golden from Hint. Hi, everyone. Super excited to be here and especially to actually be having a nice Hint conversation with, with our bottles of Hint, right, Guy? So we, uh, <laughs> yeah. we're, we're taking this show on the road. <laughs> so... Uh, I, I don't know if you're old enough, but there was this movie called Wayne's World. And <laughs> I've never in, heard of Wayne's World. I loved Wayne's no. World. So, okay. So in Wayne's World, you know how they said like, oh, and I'm drinking a can of Pepsi or something. So I'm drinking a bottle of Hint. There you and go. And when, when my hands get dirty, I use my Hint sanitizer. <laughs> And right after this, I'm going surfing. So let's put some hint sunscreen. There you go. And then when I'm out there in the real world, I'll just put on my hint mask, which I will tell you, this is my favorite mask. And I have a lot of masks, including the $30 Under Armour one. And when I'm not wearing my mask, not surfing, not sanitizing my hand or not drinking water, I read your book. So. There you and go. You're, you're on the program, that. guy. I, I love you. So. <laughs> I, I think that should be in the highlight reel. Oh, my God. So, yeah. yeah. There you go. So, uh, let, let's start off with a real inside story that you're going to have to explain. But has anyone called you sweetie lately? Not lately. Uh, but but there uh, there was a time when, when that did happen. A actually, I remember after it did happen, uh, I shared it with my dad, and uh, he was he was shocked that the that the person was able to still stand up. And I said, "Well, it was over the phone." And he was like, "Thank God that that they <laughs> called you, sweetie, over the phone because that would have probably ended really badly." But yes, it was at a time about a year into. Uh, found a hint, I ended up really getting frustrated with kind of not understanding and and of uh, so many things, including how to produce a product that had a proper shelf life and and was had no idea exactly how to distribute our product to uh, lots of stores across the u s. And so a friend in, introduced me to a gentleman who was very senior at uh, that large soda company in Atlanta. And that's when I shared all of the progress that I had made and kind of developing Hint in the Bay Area and lots of stores like Whole Foods. And, you know, I was pretty proud of myself um, uh, just based on sort of where I had been from zero and not having experience to where I had gotten. And, uh, after about 15 minutes into kind of sharing my story of how I came about doing this and what my background was, that's when he said, sweetie, Americans love sweet. This product isn't going anywhere. And I was, you know, kind of taken aback and sort of shocked again. It was over the phone. It wasn't in person. Thank goodness. But that's when I really understood that what I was doing was a very different path. I actually thought about it that day as like a river. Like he was going down this river, really trying to trick consumers into believing that products like Diet Coke, which I was addicted to, were healthier and better for you versus this other river that I was on that was actually trying to get people healthier because I had switched over to drinking water with just some fruit in it. And that actually got me um, to lose the weight that I had been trying to lose for years and get more energy and clear up my skin. And so when I realized ultimately that this person who I had initially gone to, to kind of, because he had industry experience was, you know, I, he was like a God, right? He was working for this multi-billion dollar company that had done like huge things. That was the moment when he 
called me something that really caught me off guard that I started to open my eyes and ears and pay attention to how, you know, just because he had industry experience, that didn't mean that he knew what he was talking about. So you could make the case that with hindsight, he did you a favor because he spurred you on and he psyched you up, right? Totally. And, and I share that story with entrepreneurs all the time that it's, it, you know, that sometimes things that are so shocking, right, to you when people say <laughs> something, you know, you're, you're like moving every day just as fast as you can and kind of doing your thing and, and you automatically kind of doubt yourself when you walk into an industry and you, you know, don't have experience in it. You think like, well, there's those, you know, the gods that are sitting in the technology companies or in the, you know, the famous brands that are out there. You think like, oh, if I could just get a call with them or a meeting with them. And then suddenly, like when I heard this super shocking thing, I thought, wait a minute. First of all, why should I be listening to somebody who calls me sweetie? No, that's number one. <laughs> Right. And then number two, what what I learned, not just in that early conversation, but then the next 45 minutes was when he really shared the thinking that I mean, I, I was learning their strategy around how to get to the consumer, which was significantly different than mine. And never in the next 45 minutes did he talk or say the word health. And I thought, wow, like here I am trying to get this person's attention. And like, I finally got his attention. He was insulting. And also like, it really wasn't what I thought. So a lot of people have, I've shared that story on stage. And a lot of people have said, now, why didn't you like just quit? what you were doing in terms of like the business, because here, this person who has lots of industry experience here, they've told you that it's a bad idea. I mean, forget about the words, but they've told you like, it's a terrible idea. That's not what the consumer wants. And I said, because he said something so shocking to me, I think that that was really the moment when I, then that I decided like, you know, as my parents used to say to me, when, when you know people said maybe the wrong things over the years, they'd say, "Consider the source." And that that was like a moment where I said, "Consider the source." Right? It it just became so apparent to me. And that's frankly when I hung up the phone. I said, "If I don't go build this company, no one's going to build it." Because here, this person who is at you know really the top of the heap, and you know they're they're out there you know doing supposedly great things and like what I've learned and what my consumer over the past year had learned and was really sharing with me was that we were doing something significantly different and really focused on something different than they were. So that was, that was an important lesson. And, and one, frankly, that I, you know, think about a lot, which is in every single industry, the leaders are not necessarily the ones that are going to come up with great ideas, or they're not going to be the ones that are going to be innovating. Because they yeah. are following their own, you know, roadmap. And and I think like that's the that is, I mean, wouldn't you agree? I mean, that's that's in Absolutely. every single industry. It's Absolutely. it's the case. And yet they try, they try to do it, but they just can't think differently. So well, I I mean I if I may interject here, I think the world's best example of that in technology is that in 1975, an engineer at Kodak invented digital photography. Mm -hmm. So can you imagine that engineer going to his boss and saying, I figured out a way people don't have to buy film anymore, you know, make me a hero. And of course, none of us are using Kodak digital cameras because Kodak misdefined themselves as in the chemicals business, as opposed to the preservation of memories business. So, yeah. Yeah. They, they just can't embrace something like that. Yeah. And oftentimes they're more worried about how is it going to cannibalize my existing business? I mm -hmm. mean, to your point. And I think that sadly, I mean, even since 1975, there's so many examples of that. I mean, that's, you know, the fact that these that these large beverage companies actually have a have water brands, Dasani or Aquafina inside, it doesn't mean that they ultimately make money. 
off of those water brands. In fact, frequently they're lost leadering it in order to get additional space for the soda brands or the enhanced water brands like a vitamin water. But Mm -hmm. I think, you know, that's a great example where, you know, Kodak like put their own nail in the coffin, even though they had experienced that, like, you know, there's, they still couldn't embrace that time. And we've seen it over and over again in history and it's just hard. And most CEOs that I've met along the way, typically retired CEOs of large companies have said the same thing. Like we just are not good innovators. Like we need entrepreneurs to ultimately go and create for us because that's not what happens inside our company. It's like a different skill set inside of these large companies. Well, that, you know, that is one of the the most crucial points in the history of Apple that Apple was able to cannibalize itself, right? It created a Macintosh, which killed the Apple II. Uh, it created iOS. It, I mean, iOS didn't kill the Macintosh, but it certainly is a different curve. It's not merely a continuation of the Macintosh. And there are so few examples of that in, in the world. Uh, perhaps we can go back a little bit and you tell us the genesis of Hint. Um, you know, what? why did you... <laughs> Very why successful did I do in it? tech. Yeah. Why did you do this? Yeah. So I did it because I wanted to get healthier. And so I left a career in tech. I was at AOL where I ran the e commerce and shopping partnerships. And in Silicon Valley, I was working out of um, the Bay Area and was commuting to Virginia, where AOL was based, and also New York. And the United Airlines pilots all knew my name. And I thought, this is just bad. And we've got three young kids at home under the age of four. I, I need to find something closer to home and kept looking for that, you know, perfect role after, you know, I, when I left AOL, it was a billion dollars in revenue and e-commerce partnerships. And I thought, like, I've done a great job there and maybe I'll find something else in Silicon Valley. And the truth is, is I was looking around and, I felt like everybody wanted me to go do like build what I had built at AOL. And I kept thinking like, why would I go and I've worked so hard to build something. Why would I go and build something that's better at another company? Right? Like it just, I don't know. It just like did not make sense to me to go and do that. And so that's when I really started thinking, okay, well maybe I'll do something entirely different. If I only have like a couple gigs left in me, you know, maybe that maybe it's like why I sort of fell into tech, but that like, why is that my destiny? Like just because I worked in it for seven years and why, and, and instead what, like I hadn't figured it out. What would be the ultimate thing that I wanted to wake up and do every single day? I wanted to do something where it was consumer focused, but it was something that just I loved and and it sort of satisfied my curiosity. And that's when I really looked at not as a not as a an idea to go and start a company, but instead as as really how do I get healthy? And again, I feel like so many people feel this way when they have kids where they start to, you know, focus on what they're putting in these young babies' bodies. And I thought, okay, that, but then also my own. Like I thought I'm tired all the time. I'm not traveling. So I don't really have a big excuse for why I'm traveling all the time. And I mean, why I'm not feeling that great all the time. And that's when I really started looking at what I was putting into my body and some of these different diets out there. I had never really done diets, like, but I thought, well, maybe now it's time that I've got some time to sort of figure this out and really keep track of it. And that's when I was I was really really surprised um, when I made this one little change in my diet around the, around my you know diet coke consumption. I I never really thought that the diet coke was causing me any problems though. The only kind of rules that I applied what to what I was putting into my body was that I needed to actually be able to understand them. And so I had moved into a diet of food that was really focused on, you know, 
fresh fruit and, and protein and just things that were simple. And so when I looked down at my Diet Coke and saw the ingredient label, I was like, whoa, there's like 30 ingredients in here that I don't really understand. So I thought, well, it's probably not doing anything. I'll just, I'll just put it to the side for now and see what happens. And so I swapped it out for water. Um, I always talk about, you know, we don't, as a society, I don't think we need to be educated on drinking more water. I mean, I've never met anyone who believes, actually, I've met one person who believed that we would be a lot better off if we all drank a lot of wine um, and we we actually don't need water, which I was like, okay, well, you're the only one that I've actually met that really thinks that and will actually say that. But most people know that they're supposed to drink more water, but they don't because it, they don't like the taste, right? And so there's yeah. plenty of people who like the taste of water, but obviously there are huge industries out there and, and huge businesses that are out there that are focused on getting us to put liquid in our body and not pay attention to ultimately what all the ingredients are. So after I had made the switch, two and a half weeks later, I lost over 20 pounds, my skin had cleared, my energy levels were back. And that's when I had this aha moment around just words and why I had actually thought that it was not as it, it, you know bad for me because the word diet. And it ends up, I mean, it's interesting when I was writing this book, I never really knew like the exact date that Diet Coke was developed. Do you know what that is, Guy? <sighs> Uh, sometime in the seventies, maybe I don't know. I'm later than that. And, and so, it, it, so it was interesting because I went back through this journey when I was writing my book. So my mom drank a brand that actually was discontinued tap. She played a ton yeah. of tennis in yeah. Arizona. And so when diet Coke came out, my mom said, because tab and diet Coke tasted very, very different. She said, mm -hmm. oh, there's this other, you know, drink called diet Coke. And, um, you know, that's not my drink. I like tab. And so again, tab for me was my mom's drink. Like, why would I have my mom's drink? Like that was so, you know, whatever. <laughs> and so it came out in the early eighties and that's really? when I, you know, started drinking it. And, you know, what's fascinating to me is I was a gymnast. I was like constantly, I was always running. I was constantly active and I started, you know, drinking this diet this diet Coke thinking that I was actually doing the right thing. I mean, I now look at it as, you know, I'm, I'm a test case for what happens as you age. And as you get older, I was drinking this stuff for so many years. Right. And like since the beginning and things like weight and, you know, skin issues and lots of things kind of caught up to me. And maybe that doesn't happen to everyone. But what I think is so fascinating is that the majority of people today that are drinking diet still are also the same people that are fighting with their weight and other health related issues. I mean, type two diabetes, when I started hint 15 years ago, was 2% of the population had this thing called type 2 diabetes, which for those of you who aren't familiar is different than type 1 diabetes. So it's actually typically comes on later in life. It used to actually 15 years ago, they were looking at adults who got type 2 diabetes today. There's plenty of kids who have type, type 2 diabetes, but the majority of people who have type 2 diabetes are actually drinking diet and following this claim to be following this low calorie diet. So why aren't we as a society actually looking at these diet foods and health related, healthy perception, um, you know, foods and drinks and stopping them if we know that diseases and challenges around health are, could potentially be caused by them. And we all know what the answer is. So tell us, I mean, what exactly is in a bottle of Hint? And then tell us, you know, how hard was it to get the ingredients into Hint at a commercial level? 
Yeah. So it, it's, uh, you know, started in my kitchen. There's uh, the extracts, oils and extracts of the fruit. We also use, um, we don't use kind of traditional flavor houses, which, you know, sometimes might be using natural ingredients like bug wings and uh, and bone marrow. <laughs> Those are all natural, right? And <laughs> protein, whether, protein, and protein, right? But they're not necessarily the fruit. So um, <laughs> this is all plant based. Um, you know, sometimes I'll tell you a little secret. Sometimes we'll use like grape skins um, to actually round out a fruit. Um, that it, for for the zest, we're also using the rinds. So sometimes people will share. I'm drinking a lemon here. People will say, "Oh, I I shook it up and it's kind of foamy at the top." Well, it ends up that that's what happens from the rinds. Um, that you end up having lemon and you shake it, and it's not dangerous. Um, you know, our customer service team will share that. You know, there's nothing wrong with it, it at, at all. It's just what ends up happening because we are using the entire fruit um, to well, actually flavor it. But wasn't there a point where you you had some major chemistry discovery that was a breakthrough about things not clouding up or something like that? What was that? Hmm. I'm trying to think. No, it's in it's in your book. Like one day, your husband said, "Okay, I figured out a way." Well, no, well, that was actually shelf life. And so oh, it wasn't, shelf life. Yeah, 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 yeah. So the shelf life was, I mean, when we first, one of the things I talk about in the book is actually getting it to market as fast as possible, right? In terms of it, not necessarily speed, like you may think, but just in terms of, you know, trying to not spend tons of money, actually trying to get it on the shelf, because you'll learn a ton when you get a product on the shelf. Um, from how the consumer reacts. So one of the things, and I'll get to the shelf life issue in a minute, one of the things that we did when we first launched the product was we had clear labels because we figured, you know, it's clear water, clear labels. And what we didn't realize is that the lighting in the store was like really would impact how the consumer would be able to see our product. And if we were sitting also next to colorful vitamin water labels, for example, that would actually impact how the consumer experienced our brand too. But so we we learned lots of lessons there. We couldn't figure out how to ultimately launch a beverage that had the shelf life that our first store, Whole Foods, needed, which was approximately six months. And uh, we, you know, we had like 90 days. We were sort of on borrowed time, as I like to say, with Whole Foods, because they're like, look, you know, you guys all, you guys seem nice. Um, my husband had joined me at this point, but, you know, we can't really keep your product in, in stock um, on our shelves unless you ha- get to be like six months in time. And we didn't want to use preservatives in the product. So that was like this big challenge. Um, and that's what, I talk about in the book where, you know, ultimately it was like looking at our Nespresso machine and kind of trying to think like, how do they do it? Like, how does it ultimately, you know, end up staying and, you know, what kind of temperatures are involved there that might actually allow us to do something, not exactly, but similar. And I I think that that's just another example too of something that you know, I've learned along the way, which is that just because you are doing something in our case in water, that, that doesn't mean that I should only look at other water companies, right. Or, or other flavored water companies that what I learned along the way, and I still use to this day is where do I go and look at how other, other companies, other categories, other industries are innovating and can I figure out some of those lessons that they're learn- that they're showing and talk to those founders and potentially apply those and so that was really you know we were looking at the coffee industry yes that's a beverage but it's significantly different we don't have beans we don't i mean there's lots of like reasons why it's just totally different but there were lessons 
that we were learning in that industry that really helped us to innovate and ultimately get the shelf life that we wanted. Well, I think that anybody who's a food entrepreneur or has this great idea um, is wondering, how the hell did you get into Whole Foods? So could you tell that story? Yeah. So back 15 years ago, when I launched the brand, uh, Whole Foods used to have a local um, a, a local program where they wanted to put, I think it was like 10% of their overall mix from local companies. And I've heard mixed uh, things about whether or not they're still doing that now that they're owned by Amazon. Um, but there are certain regions that still try and bring in local companies. But, you know, just getting in the door, I think, was was definitely huge. And getting it on the shelf was definitely huge. But again, then, you know, once you're actually at the party, then you actually have to figure out, okay, now, how do I dance? How do I, you know, stand out? Like, what do I wear? All of those kind of things. And, and that's really what I talk about in the book, too, that it's like, you know, you think that just getting on the shelf is the big piece, but then you realize that, you know, TikTok in terms of how much time you have, because you've actually got to have get to consumers and get them to pull it off the shelf. You've got to, you know, figure out how to get a shelf life. You've, you know, got to get it into multiple regions or else you're going to get discontinued. Uh, like all of these these problems and these pieces. And imagine, Guy, when in the early days, I was, you know, on the one hand, I was feeling great because I had gotten it on the sh shelf at Whole Foods. But then on the other hand, I'm, I'm hearing, well, yeah, you've been successful here, but you don't have the shelf life figured out. How are you going to go and get into other regions? And I'm like, but I, I got it on the shelf at Whole Foods and it's working. <laughs> and like, I'm really excited about it. They're like, well, that's great. But, you know, we want products that can actually scale. And so then I would call up the, the executive at, you know, the large beverage company, because maybe he can help me figure out how to, how to scale. And guess what? He has no interest in helping me figure out how to scale. <laughs> And then, you know, he's hearing what that a surprise, I, right? He's hearing that I came from the direct to consumer business and he's like already, you know, he, first of all, he knows nothing about direct to consumer. And so that's another lesson that I talk about in the book is that people won't actually tell you what they don't know, right? Because that would mean that they're stupid, right? Not right. really, but they think they're stupid because they don't know anything. So instead, they just discount you as not really getting it, right? So there were many moments where I'm sure if you're listening to this, if you're listening to our interview today, you may say, yeah, I didn't think she actually did get it back then. And you think about it, it's actually because I maybe knew something that you didn't. And so I think that's like, and that goes true, Guy, you and I have talked about this. I mean, that holds true for investors too, you know, in talking to investors, there were a number of investors who basically were like, oh, we drink your product all the time, but you don't really, you know, if you really get this off the ground, these big soda companies are going to crush you. And I'm like, no, 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 they're terrible at innovating. They don't believe in investing in, in water. Right. And uh, and they were like, OK, I still don't think so. And so then they would be like, OK, well, we're not going to invest in you anyway. Goodbye. And and again, you as an entrepreneur hear that and you think, oh, I have a terrible company. I you know, it's like everything. My baby is ugly. Right. Like but the reality is, is and, and really the biggest reason why I wanted to get this book out there was to know to really share with people that I've been through it. I've seen a lot of these same situations and, and, you know, you have to keep going and you have well, to celebrate your wins along the way. Well, isn't one of your major messages that you need to fake it until you make it? I, I think to some extent, but I, I think that it's also owning, you know, what you don't know. It's also mm -hmm. knowing that you're going to have challenges along the way 
And instead of giving up, it's actually figuring out who can I go to that might be able to help me try and figure out different components of, uh, of this business. I mean, the number of people, even I have an advisory council, nobody in my advisory council actually has any beverage experience. They have experience in lots of different specific things and different types of businesses that they've built. And I think that just speaks to like, there's a world out there that ultimately, you know, will help you and it doesn't have to be maybe what you think. Right. And well, that's the key thing. Well, I, I have to pitch you this softball because this is such a great story. So uh, my wife and I have four children and our first child was born with a, a via cesarean. And so, uh, you know, on the morning of his cesarean, we got in our car and drove to the hospital and, you know, well, we didn't know it was going to be a cesarean at first, but anyway, so, you know, it was like that. Now you had a very different morning of your cesarean. So can you tell us that story? Cause that is a great story. Well, the good news is, is that my, my uh, planned C-section wasn't happening until two o'clock. So I figured I would make the maximum use of my time by, instead of going to brunch that morning with my husband, I asked him if he'd come with me to Whole Foods to see if I could get our product on the shelf. So another thing that always happens in every industry is that you'll have delays. So our product was supposed to show up two weeks before I was having my plan C-section and it didn't show up in my garage until the day before. And so I had this huge pallet in my garage. I couldn't actually drive my car into the garage. I was living in San Francisco at the time. So I'm like, I want to get this thing out of here. And, you know, before I bring child number four home. And so that's when <laughs> he said, okay, fine, we'll go to Whole Foods and I'll carry the 10 cases in and I'll, you know, you'll, you'll pitch it to the guy that you had talked to. I, I think I, I mean, this was a fake it until you make it moment, sort of. I think I sort of, got my husband to believe that I was maybe further along in terms of actually selling it into Whole Foods than I actually was. Because I had had conversations with them and he was like, okay, well, is he waiting for you? I didn't even know if he was working that day. Like I just said, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah come on, we'll, we'll go. Like it, it'll be fine. So we get there and I see him in the beverage aisle and he's, you know, stocking the shelves. And that's when I said, Hey, remember me? And he turned around and he said, you are so pregnant. And I said, I am, I am pregnant. And, uh, and he said, so when are you, you're not going to deliver in my store, are you? And I said, I hopefully not, but I'm supposed to have my baby uh, this afternoon at, at, at two o'clock. So I really hope it doesn't come sooner. And he said, how do you know that you're having a baby at two o'clock? And so my husband had been around me long enough to know that I uh, would probably take this opportunity to sort of share my story of why I knew that I was having a planned C-section. So poor guy, he starts backing up into the fruits and vegetables section, thought, oh my God, I, I can't even believe she's going to talk to this kid about, you know, kid, he's like 25 year old guy who's like, you know, wants to get educated on a plan C section. So he went on to ask me the difference between a emergency C section and uh, a plan C section. And of course, I also talked to him about a vaginal delivery. And like I said, has anyone ever <laughs> talked to you about any of this? You know, and and so 15 minutes later, that's when uh, he he said, I really appreciate you taking the time to educate me on this and, you know, and good luck with delivering the baby this afternoon. And I said, wait, 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 time out. Like, can we actually uh, go back to why I'm here? I would love it if you would put my product on the shelf. And he said, well, I'll try. And I'm trying to convince him. And my husband had come back at this point and he said, Kara, stop selling like, just come on, let's go. Like, you know, he'll do it if he can kind of thing. And I was like, okay. So I went and delivered Justin without actually knowing whether or not this was like actually going to be happening at Whole Foods. 
Um, and then the what? next day, what? right? I and you know, sad. I mean, the delivery was fine, but I would have preferred to actually see the products go on the shelf. But I, I didn't get that opportunity. But then the next day, he, he called me and he said, uh, he said the product is gone, and uh, and I said, who took it? Like I still, I, I hadn't thought through as far as this, you know, the, the idea that people would actually buy the product. Like I had just thought through, let me just get it on the shelf. And now like people, he's telling me that the 10 cases are gone. And so we checked out of the hospital, um, you know, just like getting your check at a restaurant, I guess, you know, it was like, <laughs> wait, we got to go. I, I got to get to whole food. And so, you know, when you have a planned C-section, you get three days in uh, the hospital. And yeah, I said, after a day, I said, I'm out. I got to, I, I got to go. Like I've done this a lot of times. And so we went home and that's when um, my husband wouldn't let me actually go to Whole Foods to even see the product on the shelf. Well, I guess it was all gone at that point. And he said, he said, let me deliver the product. And actually the, the funnier, the, not the funnier, funnier, but it, an, an extension of that story was when he came home, he said he stopped at FedEx Kinko's because everybody was asking him for a, a business card. And he was a Silicon Valley lawyer and hadn't really had business cards. And so he, uh, he was working inside of, of Netscape and he had left Netscape and was doing a medical startup. But I said, oh, really? You stopped at FedEx Kinko's and you got some business cards? And he said, yeah. He said, how does this sound? I'm the chief operating officer of Hint Water. Can you imagine? <laughs> I, I could imagine you saying that guy like something like he just thought it was so funny that he was like calling cases in his like Grand Cherokee for his wife. And he was like, I'm the chief operating officer. And oh he's still God. the chief operating officer. <laughs> 15 years later. <laughs> and how many employees do you have now? Two, about a little over 200. Yeah. yeah. So he's, yeah. Uh, but he, you know, I think for him, he really, he, he's the son of a doctor um, who for years he was hearing frustrations that his dad had with, you know, trying to really help um, diagnose patients and help get them better. And, and, you know, then they, the patients would go home. And he would know, mm -hmm. he wouldn't know whether or not they did what he said to do. Right. And, and, you know, it was just like this frustration. And again, he had worked on this medical information systems company that was helping um, diagnose patients better through a um, patient interview um, way ahead of its time, um, you know, eight, almost 18 years ago now. And that's when he said, you know, this is so simple it's almost crazy. Like, you know, you've, you do not have experience as a nutritionist. You do not have a, you are not a doctor and you're telling people just go drink water and you'll change your health for like, you know, a little more than a buck, a bottle. You're like telling people just go do this and like their health will change. He was like, it's so crazy. It actually might work. And you may actually not only disrupt an industry, but you may actually help people get the most important thing back, which is their health. Right. And so yep. he was, so that's what he saw in this. And again, also saw I was way ahead of where most consumers were. And so while he was trying to figure out what he wanted to do, he said, I'll just help you. I'll load up the, you know, load up the Grand Cherokee and, you can stay in the car or I'll stay in the car while the babies are in the baby seats. And, um, but you know, we not only had plenty of Silicon Valley people laughing at me saying, wait, what are you doing? Why aren't you taking a job at some of these tech firms and you want to run, you want to start a beverage company, but we were at this point, the insane couple, right? Cause he's a Silicon Valley attorney having offers, you know, thrown at him. And he was like, no, I think my wife might be losing it. I'm not sure, but she's writing <laughs> huge checks off of our personal bank account for like bottles and caps. And she gets excited when like she figures out that caps are not called caps, they're called closures. 
And, you know, and it's like, she's like, oh my gosh, I figured something out today. It makes like the whole, once you know the vocabulary, like the world is just like, like your oyster. And he, and, and so that's when he said, I really want to jump in here. And cause you're just having a good time doing it, but it's also just fun. And it'd be really fun to do this together. Can, can you address how the pandemic has changed your business? I think that the key thing that, you know, I always encourage people to look back on their business and figure out like what you could have done better or what you had done great that really enabled your business. And I'll start with, you know, what we did great. And, and this was really my husband on, on the operation side, we automated so much of our business and really spent the last four years focusing on supply chain issues and not just around how, how do we actually get to stores, but we went around the country and set up our, set up our manufacturing as close to our distribution points as possible because we thought we could save money. Um, we'll use, you know, as local resources as possible, including, you know, workforce, um, Many companies in the beverage industry actually um, have components of their product that come from Asia. So most cans actually come from Asia. Um, you know, we've we've really just felt that we if we keep it as local as possible, then it's a lot easier to kind of keep an eye on it, even if it's uh, maybe a little more expensive. So during the pandemic. Um, you know, we were seeing we we were really stocked at, at stocked up in our warehouses to be able to have a huge year in 2020. We had just gone into Walmart and Sam's Club and all these some giant distribution, including our direct to consumer business, which is pretty big and and was growing back then. But but when we got a call in the middle of the pandemic from Costco saying, hey, we we want to flip the switch and have you go nationwide because we're having problems with some of our um, suppliers, um, some of our beverage companies that we deal with because they can't get the cans. They can't get different components. I mean, that was like a time when, when we really looked at, again, coming in to this industry, not really knowing even 15 years later what we should be doing but instead doing things that we really believed were smart. Um, going also back to something that we talked about earlier that's in the book around um, you know, shelf life. What we also learned uh, about shelf life is that, and, and ultimately how we um, get to the proper shelf life, we pasteurize our product. And so, uh, so, and we were really the first non-alcoholic beverage that, that was that was using a pasteurization process um, in to actually create the product. So we don't use preservatives in it, but the, in addition to that, we thought because we don't use preservatives and when you use preservatives, you kill off all kinds of bacteria. That's when we uh, decided, well, how would bacteria ultimately come into the product? They come in through people and people who are working on the assembly lines so we ended up getting all of the people out of the fill room by this last December, which was so key. So when the pandemic hit, that was another piece where lots of, you know, not just beverage companies, but also food manufacturers ran into trouble because obviously people were getting sick. The FDA was actually sniffing around all food and beverage manufacturers trying to figure out if, if COVID was coming in through the food supply. Um, or through the water supply. And when they came into our factories and saw how prepared we were, it, they like literally came in and then walked out the door because we didn't have any people in the room. So I think that those were really, really the key things that we learned um, along the way. And, and frankly, you know, we're still learning. I mean, we don't feel like we have it all figured out and all the answers. We're constantly looking at ways uh, to improve. But I think that that's, that that's something that, you know, I share with all entrepreneurs that it's like being a little paranoid, um, I think is, is actually a really good thing. Okay. You know, we have got a bunch of good questions and we have about 
10 minutes. Right on. So I am going to ask you some questions that I see. And we got a bunch of them. So you're going to have to give them the abbreviated version. Okay. Okay. All right. So, I, and I'm interested about this. So number one, what do you think about kom- kombucha? Um, so, uh, so here, here's what I would say. And, and I, I think kombucha, first of all, kombucha is mushrooms, um, that get, you know, fermented and, and, uh, they turn into alcohol. So a lot of people don't realize that, um, if you are trying to stay away from alcohol, I've talked to a few of people who I know who are alcoholics who have drank kombucha and I have to, you know, share the bad news with them that part of, you know, you get a little bit of a high off of kombucha. So you just have to be careful. Do I believe that there's some probiotic, um, benefits that come from it possibly. Um, but I also think you just have to be careful. Okay. Uh, what's your top tip to trailblazing women like you trying to go out there and you know, take on Coca-Cola, defy you know, the people calling you sweetie? I think that the key thing, and this is sort of a, maybe a little bit of a life lesson, but don't take on too much. Like don't, don't, because you can really get yourself overwhelmed. And I think that starts with, you know, just take on a couple things every single day. And so that was the key thing for me in, in building this company was if I actually stopped to think about, okay, how am I going to go and tackle these, you know, soda giants and, and really compete with them and get in every door across the country? I mean, that's like, that's really hard, right? And instead, think about, okay, how do I get in, into local companies and, 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 you know, retailers and kind of start small and then celebrate your successes. Because if you start to add up your successes, you see that you're making progress. And so I think that that's such a key thing. Okay. Uh, What do you think the biggest obstacle is to Americans improving their health? We are addicted to sweet. Actually, I think there's there, we're addicted to two to, to two things. If you're not addicted to sweet, you're probably addicted to uh, savory or salty. And so, um, you know, most people. I mean, what what is it for you, guy? Do you like sweet or salty? <laughs> both. <laughs> you like both. Of them. Yeah, and I like that- I like salt, sweet, and carbs. Besides that, I have a perfect diet. Yeah. So, but that, but that's the thing. And so I think I always share with people that I think that the, you know, the key to actually getting healthy is not totally eliminating. That's unrealistic to eliminate, but it's basically not, not allowing it to take control of your life. Cause I'm convinced when I talk to people about, you know, getting healthy, that, that and really kind of the thing that they do every single day mine was was diet coke it was it was that sweet and and you know and and that is the thing and again like i didn't want to trade um sweet and and go over into you know sodium there's plenty of people who are addicted to you know frito company you know the chips and stuff like that you've got a huge addiction to to you know the savory and that you should try and figure out as well, right? And tone it down a little bit and try and really, you know, get get as neutral as possible on, the, on those grounds. Uh, a week ago, I interviewed Tim Kendall and he was on the movie, The Social Dilemma. Mm-hmm. And he draws the comparison between big sugar and big social in that in both cases, you know, we don't need to have sugar nutritionally and we don't need to have social media intellectually but both industries are totally geared towards us using as much sugar and as much social media as possible i thought that was a very and both of them are having negative effects so i thought that was a very interesting um comparison it is really interesting and and there there was an article in the new yorker uh a few weeks ago about you know the latest effort 
of the big soda companies, which is to develop a sugar um, that is actually low cal. And why is that? Because these diet sweeteners, people are onto it and they don't, and they have a bad name. And so, you know, if we can just get sugar to actually have zero calories, I mean, like, (laughs) and the first thing I thought of when I read that article, I'm like, why don't we actually try and encourage people to move away from sweet? Oh, wait a minute. That could actually tank our, our public company. Right. So why don't we instead like figure out how to trick people more. And I mean, and then once they get unhealthy, like we don't care about them anyway, right? Because they're like a lost cause. And so it's a very sad cycle that, you know, these large companies are putting in, especially in the food and beverage, uh, but also in beauty and lots of other, you know, it, situations where where we're, you know, really a lab rat and, when we ultimately need help the most, unfortunately, we're living in society where, you know, access to, to healthcare and it, 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 at best it's, it's, you know, expensive. Okay. Uh, Let's suppose a teenage girl is watching this or in our case, listening to this. And uh, what would be your primary message to that teenage girl? The same thing I tell my kids, which is, you know, the trick is actually figuring out what you want to do every single day, right? And and figuring out if you can actually um, find something that that you know really makes you get up in the morning and that you get excited about. And I think actually having a relationship with customers in some way. Um, is really, really helpful because if you can get feedback from customers, I mean, Guy, how many people talk to you about, you know, your, your, not only your products that you've worked on or developed, but also, you know, your podcast. It's like when people actually give you feedback that it's helping, I mean, that is just, that's so powerful. And that's what I hear every single day, not just with my product, but my book and the podcast. I mean, the feedback that consumers give is that's fuel. Right. And so if you can actually develop something where you're going to be able to have that feedback, I think that that is just that that there's nothing that can replace that. I I will tell you something interesting. I I think that um, for my books, my speeches, my podcasts, negative feedback, assuming it's not, you know, sadistic, just trying to rip you just for the sake of a power play, but negative construction, constructive feedback is the most useful thing. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And it, I agree. I, and, and I think it's like, as long as it's constructive, I think that, mm-hmm. I think that that is. And as I always say, even if it's not constructive, there's always like a little bit of a grain of truth. Right. And, and you know, what somebody might say. Okay. Now uh, it is an informed tradition to ask every speaker this final question. Okay. So this final question across all speakers is, what is your 60-second idea to change the world, Kara Golden? To change the world, I would say uh, disclose, disclose what is negative about your product and dis- and what is positive about your product. And if we actually had... Um, transparency in products across the world, I still believe that consumers would actually still go and buy your products. But if you actually said, okay, this is what, this is what is going to be, you know, this is what I'm going to be selling you versus actually trying to trick people. I, I think that that is something that we should ultimately um, strive towards as a society. We could start with politicians. But. We could, right? <laughs> right. I Just mean, tell me who that. you are and tell me what you're for instead right. of messing around and and making yeah. it our job to figure it out. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, thank you, Carol, for doing this. It, it was just great. And I hope entrepreneurs listening to this take a great lesson. And But really, it's beyond entrepreneurship. It's life lessons. So, 
Um, I want to remind our viewers that Carol's new book is called Undaunted, and she has a line of hint products, including deodorant, <laughs> sunblock, sanitizer, water, and the best mask, I swear. <laughs> so, uh, so uh, you know, the Commonwealth Club's uh, effort is trying to make this virtual programming very interesting and available. So please vi visit the CommonwealthClub.org. Uh, and I'm Guy Kawasaki. And this was In Forum from the Commonwealth Club with Kara Golden. Thank you very much, Kara. Thanks, everybody. And come visit me as well at Kara Golden all over social. I'd love to say hi.